Cyanobacteria are the most problematic organism we have in our freshwater ecosystems. In the last few years, uh, over 35 states have um, reported cyanobacterial blooms. Cyanobacteria and the toxins they produce pose a growing challenge to the water industry today. Despite decades of research, there is still much to be learned. Cyanobacteria are actually um, not algae. A lot of people think of them as algae, but they're truly bacteria. Cyanobacteria are uh, single-cell, microscopic, photosynthetic, aquatic organisms. And they are essentially ancient. They're ubiquitous. They're naturally occurring. But under certain conditions, they can grow out of control, unchecked by natural cycles in the water. Cyanobacteria grow uh, when there's a lot of heat units, a lot of light and a lot of nutrients. And the nutrients that they typically need that are very important are phosphorus and nitrogen. When that happens, that produces good growing conditions for the cyanobacteria. In addition to creating problems for recreational activities, they can affect the drinking water in several ways. And one of the ways is through taste and odor. They create water that tastes like mud. Um, or moldy water, and if you send that kind of tasting water out to your customers, they don't appreciate it. But they also produce cyanotoxins themselves, and these are compounds that have been shown to have uh, problems for liver, kidney, uh, nervous system effects in humans. Despite the potential health risks, there is no consensus regulation, either in the U.S. or globally. Cyanotoxins are currently not regulated by the EPA. EPA in June of last year issued health advisories, but they are not safe drinking water regulations. Without clear guidance, utilities are struggling to monitor and manage cyanobacterial blooms, respond quickly to events, and effectively communicate with their stakeholders and the public. So there's predominantly two methods used. One is the ELISA method, which is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, and then the other is LCMSMS, which is liquid chromatography followed by mass spectrometry. But LCMSMS has a lengthy turnaround time and is expensive, while the ELISA method is problematic. The detection limit of that test is close to the current health advisory level. So again, at that level, there's a huge potential for variations, you know, because that's your detection limit. And that's why it's so important to know your own system and have an understanding as to what are the different directions that different populations of cyanobacteria can go to. It really involves the development of a site-specific action plan. That plan, the MMT plan, is a comprehensive approach to monitor, manage, and treat cyanobacteria. Under monitoring, you're going to be doing a lot of monitoring much earlier than you probably had, more parameters than you probably had in the past. Management refers to managing your watershed, your source, also could include uh, additional resources, whether it be a raw water source you could switch to or a finished water source. Treatment would involve strategic treatments of your source, also treatment changes at the plant. We have multi-barrier. We've got the PAC, powder activated carbon, that removes it by adsorption. The GAC, which removes it by absorption. Uh, the UV, AOP, which is ultraviolet light advanced oxidation. The other thing that we have is the chlorine that you add for disinfecting the water. Because different types of cyanotoxins require different treatment methods, the key is in understanding the specific toxin of concern. When we think about cyanobacteria and the cells coming into the human plant, um, those bacteria basically are a little packet of um, material and those cyanobacteria produce cyanotoxins, and some of the toxins are extracellular. They come out of the cell and are present in the water, and some of them remain inside of the cell, and they're called intracellular. The problem for a water treatment facility is extracellular toxins are treated with oxidants, like chlorine, ozone, permanganate. Intracellular toxins need to be removed with the cyanobacteria themselves, or as those cyanobacteria burst or start to die, they re-release um, the toxins into the water treatment plant. And that's the big challenge for water utilities to manage the intracellular and the extracellular cyanotoxins. Because bloom toxicity is difficult to predict, utilities should implement active source water monitoring and control. The most important thing on the toolbox is to try to apply it as much as possible on the source water side of things so that there is less impact on the treatment side of things. Then if we find that the particular bloom that is developing 
happens to be potentially a producer, then we'll go ahead and test and see whether or not it is producing. And that's what our early warning comes from, and we can start tracking it. With 30 years of research on cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins, the Water Research Foundation is an excellent resource for helping develop effective monitoring, management, and treatment solutions. All of those resources, published literature, uh, research foundation studies, have been incredibly useful for us. Recently, the Foundation convened a cyanobacteria research needs workshop to identify knowledge gaps and guide a new research focus area to help utilities with cyanobacteria and cyanotoxin monitoring, control, and communication strategies.